I've got notes. Half the time I don't even use notes. But I like the illusion that I'm somewhat prepared, even though I just fly by the seat of my pants the majority of the time. At least I made an effort. In this video, I will be doing my very first VR mashup to Livy at Crescent Dreams Tarot and Jonaki at Catamancy Tarot and their hashtags Tarot Community Build and Tarot Origin Story, respectively. Let's do this thing. <laughs> a crap ton of noise outside my building today. Everybody just feels the need to make as much noise as they possibly can today. And our our handyman is hanging around, but he's really cool, so he can do what he wants. Everybody else, I don't know what the problem is. Like, seriously don't know. I've got hot cocoa going on right now because it's a hot cocoa kind of moment. I needed that, that, that cozy, that cozy beverage. Noise. And I forgot I had some frosted mint syrup in my rack <laughs> with my coffee stuff and I was just like frosted mint hot cocoa for the win. And I'm winning. So this morning in my subscriptions feed, I saw Livy's video in which they created a tag called Tarot Community Build, which is essentially a series of questions to sort of get to know people better. I've seen other tags that are somewhat similar um, in concept. I think there was one get to know your tarot tubers or or something like that, but I really liked Livy's questions. And Livy's second question is a perfect segue into another VR that I have been wanting to do for weeks, actually, no, months. But, and I actually filmed three intros. I filmed three separate intros, different intros for that video, and I didn't like any of it, and it didn't feel right, like how I wanted to do it. And then after I watched Livy's video, I was like, that's how I'm going to do that VR. I'm going to do a mashup. So, so that's what you're getting from me in this one. <laughs> so uh, Livy's tag is Tarot Community Build. Jonaki's tag is Tarot Origin Story. So I will be incorporating Jonaki's tag into Livy's tag because it goes perfectly with one of the questions that Livy has asked. I will link both of the original videos, both Livy's and Jonaki's, in the description box, and I will also do my best to link anything that I feature or mention. Sometimes I forget. I, I try to write them down, <laughs> but I don't always remember to get everything. Um, if there's something you are curious about and you look in the description box and you find you can't find the information, um, there, feel free to leave a comment and I will do my best to, to answer your question. Okay, let's get this VR mashup started. Um, Livy has presented a series of questions, which I have, I have written down on my, on my, on my lovely little clipboard. That's pretty much my planner is my second brain, but this is an extension of that. So I guess this is a e second brain extension. I have no idea where I'm going with that. Absolutely nowhere. Let's move on to the VR. So we're starting with the tarot community build Livy's tag. And then when we get to question two, I will be filtering in John Key's tag just because it's perfect. So for Livy's tag, question number one is it's three parts. Name, preferred pronouns, channel name relatively straightforward. So my first name is Kristen. I've mentioned that I think in one other video. Um, most people who watch me regularly know me as Kay. I can go by Kristen or Kay. Kay is a nickname that my aunt gave me. 
my dad's sister years ago and nobody else really uses it, but I've always kind of loved it. And so when I started my channel, I was like, I'm going to go by K because it's just an excuse. <laughs> it's, it's a reason for me to, um, to be able to use that nickname that I adore. So Kristen or K, I, I'm good with either. So that's name. Preferred pronouns. My preferred pronouns are she and her. And channel name. My channel name is Amidst the Gray, which you are watching now. So that's question one. Question number two. This is where things get mashy. What first got you into tarot? And if you have a channel, why did you create it? John Akee's tag, Tarot Origin Story, is going to filter into the first part of that question. What first got you into tarot? And I just think that's perfect. This is a perfect way to, to essentially create that video, a video within the video. This is just perfect. So what got me into tarot? I came to tarot, I, I guess, later. Um, I'm 41 and tarot came into my life in 2019 in the late, actually, no, technically, no, it was late summer because it was still early September. Um, I started with Oracle and technically I didn't even start with that. That summer, I was really feeling a need to bring journaling back into my life. I had not journaled in years and a, a, I just felt like that that was a missing piece of um, my experience that I, I really felt disconnected from and that I really wanted to bring back in to my to my regular everyday life, at least on a semi-regular basis. And I had read an article, I can't for the life of me remember which where that article came from. It's like, after I read that, the whole thing is like a blur just because <laughs> every I found everything and everything found me kind of all at once. But I read an article that was about journaling with affirmation cards. And I thought that was an interesting concept and I was really I had an idea of maybe what affirmation cards were but I wasn't 100% sure and then once I kind of got acquainted with what they were I quickly realized that that was not for me um, there's nothing wrong with affirmation cards I think they can be highly beneficial depending on your situation and the context in which you use them but for me at that time they were not going to be useful for me and they I still haven't used them <laughs> um, like three and a half years later. But what quickly hooked me, once I started researching affirmation cards, Oracle just filtered in there, you know, like really seamlessly. It was like, you know, blinking and it was essentially transitioning from one to the other. So I discovered the the, the wide world of, of Oracle cards and I knew that this was something that could work. But then I quickly realized that it was a rabbit hole of possibilities as far as topic and art style and creator and size of cards how much did i want to spend on these things you know it was it was it was just a whole it was a whole thing and um I, I, as, as I compared different different decks, I realized what I wanted for this purpose, for this purpose of bringing journaling back, I wanted a deck with a theme or a topic that I felt very connected to and that also had a simple keyword or phrase, just like a little prompt or jumping off point that I could, that I, that I could use as a springboard to kind of... Um, propel that process forward. After doing a little bit of research, I found exactly what I was looking for in the Hedgewitch Botanical Oracle by Ciolo Thompson. First of all, it was a topic that I resonate with, which is plants and herbs, botanicals in general. Um, I use herbs and spices and um, essential oils and all things herby and planty in a myriad of ways so that was that ticked one of the boxes um just the the minimal kind of use of color that stark white background with just the simple beautiful illustration of each botanical and then there's that lovely keyword 
right there at the bottom. That was just perfect. So this hit the mark for me for that. Then I got an idea of what the guidebook looked like. And I will, I have said it and I'll say it, say it again. This forever, it's probably a bit shiny because glossy and the light is right there, but we'll see. It's full color. It's deep and informative. And she includes other illustrations that are not in the cards. And there's also a feature on seasonal use and there are recipes. So for example, things to make in the spring. And it just, it just checked all those boxes. And not only that, but Ciolo is a Pacific Northwest, or more specifically a Washington state based creator. And that was very meaningful to me. That is where I'm from. And so many of these botanicals are ones that I see like on a regular basis. For example, Blackberry. I have blackberry vines outside my door right there. And in August, it's picking every day. So that's just, it's so relevant to me and my life. Fern, I have a giant fern pot on my patio. Pine, also very prevalent. Huckleberry, we, we have the red huckleberry, huckleberries versus the purple. The purple are found elsewhere in Washington, more in the south part of the state, but um, these feature the purple, but we have more of the red, but they're huckleberries nonetheless. And then, where's the other one? Let me find it. Salal, everywhere. And Salal is a very important, um, a very important botanical for a lot of our migrant workers. That's how they make their living is they, they pick and process Salal. So this is, it's extremely relevant to, to my home and to the families of students um, with whom I work. And it just hit me kind of in all, in all the feels. And so um, this is kind of how this was my this was my gateway. <laughs> this is how this is how I I started. But what kind of prompted me was in this guidebook, Ciolo references tarot. In many of the descriptions of the cards, there are included tarot correspondences. So for example, for Hawthorne, if we turn the page, turn one more page. There are references to the tarot here. So it says the tarot's magician and high priestess are very reminiscent of this plant as they too stand at the threshold between worlds and marshal strength and power from both the seen and unseen realms. So there are direct tarot correspondences for a lot of these cards. And that got me curious about tarot. And then I remembered that I had a tarot deck in my possession but it's technically not mine <laughs> and and I never I didn't read with it but I used it as a reference point just to get acquainted with the system the way this deck came into my life is odd it's very very odd um, this deck belonged to um, a former partner of my stepbrothers and when they were at my parents' house, um, she abruptly left and left some things behind, including this box right here. And somehow this box got put in with some of my stuff. I don't know if my, I still don't know how it happened, if my stepmom thought that maybe this was mine because I have other wooden boxes that are similar, so maybe she just assumed it was mine and put it with my stuff. But then when I went through that, that box after um, I moved into where we are now uh, five years ago, I was just like, this isn't mine. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, what's in there? And what's in here was a tarot deck and a set of beads. And... 
I was like, huh. I knew what it was. I, 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 I knew what Tara was, you know, I, I've seen, I've seen all, most of the James Bond movies, you know, I, 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 I know, I, I know what Tara was. I was familiar with what the RWS looked like, and I've seen it in like magazines and other things. I was well aware of what Tara was, and I could recognize a tarot card um, if I saw one. But as a, I had no concept of the system or how it worked at that time. But after I looked in this guidebook, and there were tarot references, and I rem after I saw this for the first time, I just kind of put it away. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Well, I'll just put it aside and keep it safe. And maybe, you know, she'll come back sometime and I can return it to her. Um, that hasn't happened. <laughs> um, I have a feeling this box is mine. <laughs> but, um, but I will, if I do ever see her again, I will, I will happily return this box to her. And thank her because of what it has done for me um, as far as bringing tarot into my life but the deck that was in here is the secret tarot uh it's a low scarabeo deck this is the old this is the old printing with the languages on the top i got the deck out after i got that in my in my head about the tarot connections in that oracle guidebook i was just like i'm just gonna go maybe take a look and i knew that this was not a beginner friendly deck i don't know how i knew i just knew <laughs> it, it didn't look like anything i had ever seen but it still intrigued me enough to kind of go through it and i looked online for any resources i could find and they're really and still to this day, there really aren't, there really isn't a whole lot about this deck. This is a deck I really wish there had been a supplemental book published. To my knowledge, there isn't. The Little White Book is okay, but the art in this deck is so unique. It's kind of graphic novel-y, superhero-y, otherworldly in some instances. It's just, it's very unique. And I really wish that there was some supplemental material for it. So this was the first tarot I ever held in my hands and it's not even mine, <laughs> but, but it was, it was pivotal in pushing me forward to kind of make that jump to tarot. I knew I wanted, um, I wasn't going to read with this one. It, it wasn't mine. So I was prompted to go, um, get my own and you can tell that this one has been used i mean the edges are worn and slightly discolored this deck had some love and i think that's i think that's amazing so once i decided to acquire my own deck i decided to go with a kind of a foundational basic and i got myself a an rws and i got the borderless centennial smith weight I just ordered it from Amazon and oh look the very first tarot card I ever drew is at the bottom of the deck uh, that's kind of fitting I suppose King of Swords King of Swords is a very important card to me um, this was the first card I ever drew when I got this deck and I, I really had no idea what I was doing I had an idea of what each suit was kind of responsible for just because I had done a little tiny bit of research once I was um, look at when I was looking at this but I was still I, I was I was so I was very green <laughs> in my practice I really knew nothing but when I got the deck I opened it I looked through it I shuffled it and I asked the question what can the tarot teach me just thought I'd keep it simple and I did my shuffling and pulled. I just did it very intuitively based on how I was feeling at the time. And I pulled King of Swords. And I heard in my head, like somebody else is right in front of me speaking, I heard, I will teach you to speak your truth. Just, just like that. And it's... And, um, you know, swords are about mental activity and communication is a big part of that. And the king is um, a more developed and refined energy for making of swords is air of air. So this is like 
the ultimate strategist and effective communicator and kind of blew me away. Um, and I was hooked. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was it. That was, that was just all, that was it for me. Everybody knows what this looks like, but for some reason I always feel compelled to show cards anyway. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> oh, death card. <laughs> that's my Zodiac card. So that's also fitting. So this was the first tarot I ever bought for myself and read with. And this older edition of the Secret Tarot is the first deck I have ever held in my hand. And at the end of last year, I felt an urge to bring my own copy of this into my library. Uh, I had never felt that. I was like, I could totally do without that deck in, in my library. I don't, I don't need it. It didn't really, I got a bit out of it, but it didn't really pull me in. And I was just thought, I don't need that one. I needed it. And so I got it. And as it turns out, they reprinted it. So now, instead of these backs and the languages and the number on top and the suit on the bottom there the new edition has these backs with the two of cups and these fronts with the more um simplified kind of look and I really like it. This deck um, in this form has grown on me <laughs> a lot. This is so far my first and only deck acquisition of this year. I haven't, I bought this in January, pretty much right after the first of the year. I haven't bought anything since then. but I'm really enjoying this deck. I'm getting to know it. It's, it, it's, it's, it's weird. It's different and there's not very much material out there for it. So I'm really figuring out how to work with it in my own way. And I'm loving it. There are these little white micro borders. I might get rid of those. Haven't decided, not sure. This is very, it's got a lot of RWS but Justice is at 8 and Strength is at 11. It's a low Scarabeo deck, which is pretty typical for them. So, and the minors, the numbered minors are different. That's part of one of the questions that I will, I'll touch, another one of the questions I'll touch on, but, but yeah. So essentially this evolved into this, which evolved into this, which eventually became this. <laughs> And, and, and that whole process um, started in 2019. I found Oracle in August of 2019, and then Tarot came in um, when I really started looking at this deck. Um, Tarot came in in, um, in September. That was a very long-winded answer to one half of a single question. But that's how it happened, so what are we gonna do? So that was... Um, Part one of question number two, what first got you into tarot? Second part is, if you have a channel, why did you create it? It's also kind of a loaded question. Um, I wanted to create a channel, honestly, as soon as I got into tarot. I, and I, I, I was just like, I started watching tarot too and seeing all of these creators making content about tarot and how and just the sheer amount of knowledge and experience i found kelly from truth and story who is still i think overall has been the most influential figure for me on tarot tube and um almost kind of in general as far as her knowledge base and her breadth both her breadth of knowledge and her depth of knowledge um, I've learned so much from Kelly and she'll never know probably how much um, her her resources have um, meant to me in my practice. But yeah, after discovering Kelly's channel, I just thought that would be so cool to just put content out there. 
But, you know, that whole, you know, imposter syndrome thing that it's it's very much it's very real for me um, a lot of the time. And I just didn't feel um, I had enough knowledge and I didn't have enough in that foundational piece to to start a channel. And I knew nothing about filming. Yeah, I really pretty much wanted to do it from the get go. But I had I was I had reservations and doubts, essentially. Um, I wanted to get a bit of a firmer footing and really kind of hone in how I wanted my channel to be and that to, I mentioned this in my working with the Knights video I kind of talked about this as well it was a long process it was a long process and finally I got to the point where I turned 41 last year on the 3rd of November and I uploaded my first video the next day on the 4th because I just said it's time you know if I don't do it now when am I going to do it? You know, honestly, and I felt a lot more comfortable at that point as far as my, my, my knowledge base and what I felt I had to contribute. And so it just felt like it was the right time. And there is, there's a part of me that's very much a performer. Um, I, I kind of have a bit of that in me. It, the in fact I think I was three or four and you know when you know kids are that young and a well-meaning adult asks the very loaded question what do you want to be when you grow up you know because when you're three you have all the answers come to think of it actually maybe you do maybe you do have all the answers at three and you can express them because societal conditioning hasn't yet beaten them out of you I think there's there might be something there I digress I remember being asked that question don't remember by whom you know I don't even know if it was anybody in my family but I remember saying I wanted to be an actress I wanted to be in movies um, I had a big thing for um, old like black and white movies and old TV shows from the 50s and 60s and I was very I, I really I very much have some of that performer in me. I started playing clarinet when I was 11. I played all the way through high school and even a bit in college. I do uh, sing. I haven't performed in a in a group for about 15 years. It's been a long time. The occasional karaoke does get me though, and, and I will do that. Even that I haven't done. It's probably been at least five years <laughs> since I've done karaoke, but um, I have a bit of there's just a bit of that uh, performer in me, and this felt like a very sort of natural avenue for me to take. And again, a very loaded, long-winded answer <laughs> to, that, to that question. But but yeah, that's that's why I created my channel because I felt like I was at a point where I had something to contribute, and I really started to feel my inner performer kind of come out of her shell a little bit so so that's that answers that part I think question number three what is your tarot aesthetic and what kinds of decks are you attracted to as far as aesthetic I don't know if I really have a single aesthetic that I'm attracted to I it's just kind of if I see something and I like it I like it it's kind of like music for me um, I like a wide variety if I like it, I like it, and if I don't, I don't. I suppose that's kind of how that works. As far as aspects of decks, I suppose that I'm attracted to, I'm at the point now where I really, really want a deck to offer me something that's a bit different, particularly within the numbered minors, um, just because so many decks are RWS based or clones and they follow that sort of pattern very kind of predictively um if if a tarot has numbered minors that maybe can be loosely rws based but they have a twist they offer something a little bit different i am uh that is something that intrigues me i'm in i'm in at least to just um take it under under consideration a really really good example this deck is going to come out for more than one thing because it's applicable for more than one thing and I just like it so much. Um, the Mara Loon. RWS based deck. 
Um, I have the Game Crafter version. This is by Clary Sage Moon. That's the creator's um, Instagram. But this is an RWS based deck, but the miners offer a lot of them a bit different, like that Four of Pentacles. This is not the figure clutching the coins. It's different. And the Three and Ten of Swords. And the knights are really up close, which for me is um, really bringing out that fire quality in them, emphasizing their intensity. Three of Swords. Extremely pippish Three of Swords. And it's, it's one that, if you're familiar with RWS, you can see how it kind of goes there. But it's so much more open and flexible in its interpretation. This is the kind of deck that will pull me in, at least in this point in time. It's those those miners that offer something a little bit different. And even the majors too, but but the miners, just because because I read so elementally and numerologically, I like to be able to take those basic personal correspondences that I have for the miners and apply it to something a little bit different. So Decks that offer me something different um, for the miners, I guess, is the biggie right now as far as what I'm attracted to. But as far as like an overall aesthetic, I don't think I can, I don't think I have a singular aesthetic. Uh, Coco break. Question number four, your favorite system in which would you like to learn? Um, as far as an established system, I really don't have one. If I had to choose, if I, if I could only choose to read, if I had to pick one system to read for the rest of my life, I would probably pick Marseille just because there is more flexibility with the minors. Um, the, the numerological and elemental connections really come in to play there. And then for the majors and the courts, there's also the colors and the body positions and the directionality and Marseille as a whole, as far as openness to interpretation, I feel offers um, a little bit more than the other established systems. I mean, my, my, my personal system that I use is it's elemental and numerological, and I will apply it to pretty much any deck that I get my hands on. But as far as like the big three, RWS, Toph, Marseille, if I had to pick one of those, I would choose Marseille. The second part of that question, which would you like to learn? And I'm going to go outside of the box on this and say none of the big three, but rather a very specific style of miners. And that is the Hughes Picard system of miners, where the elements of air and water are, or the suits of, the suits of, cups and swords elementally are switched. So the swords are water and the cups are air. So here, for example, this is the universal worth, the nine of cups down there, and we see that butterfly. The butterfly is often associated with air. I'm working on trimming this deck. Here's the ace of cups. Isn't that gorgeous? So amazing. And then there is the butterfly. And it's also a castle in the sky. <laughs> it's this representation of air. It's a very different system. It's very unique. It's very specific. And I am still having a hard time wrapping my head around that elemental switch. <laughs> but um, it is it is a system that intrigues me. This is also Los Scarabeo. Um, a lot of times Hughes Picard Miners are paired with Worth-inspired Majors, as in the case of this deck here. Worth Majors are somewhat similar in appearance to Marseille and the older decks, but there is some esoteric layering within them. So it's a very, very interesting approach, and it's one that if I feel inclined to maybe try something new, I would probably be this. Question number five, top three major arcana. My very favorite major is one that people often overlook. And it's the major I think I hear most often say, 
the blank card is not my favorite major. I think that's interesting. I don't know if they're thinking about it just in terms of how it looks, because if that's the case, then yeah, I can understand. But as far as meaning goes, my favorite major, hands down, is the Wheel of Fortune. Not so much for how it looks, because in most decks, you know, it's not the most spectacular card, but for what it means. The, it, the wheel is an absolutely pivotal reminder for me that your life can change in an instant. You could be in the middle of a natural disaster, a loved one could die, you could get very sick, and that's out of your hands there's th that that's it's it's coming it's there and there's nothing that you could do about the situation what you can control is your behavior and how you react to what's happening to you and that's often very hard it's a test <laughs> you're like am i ever going to get to get through this but i hear a lot and read a lot um, in resources about the wheel saying that the wheel is turning and the further are if the further you are out the more chaotic that your experience is going to be but the more that you can remain in the middle in the center the less chaotic your experience might be and i relate that to behavior to um, reactivity and how an individual reacts to a situation that is put upon them and um, that initial reaction and behavior can determine how the rest of that plays out and for, for me it's behavior is a big thing for me and if there's one thing i've realized over the years is that I cannot control other people's behavior. I don't want to control other people's behavior. Yeah, my, my, my kid is 17, you know, he's pretty much grown and I'm at the point where now I am, I'm still responsible for him legally and, um, you know, for me morally and ethically, but he's at that age now where behavior, behavior wise, you know, it's, it's, it's him. It's, He's not, you know, one, two, three, four years old anymore. And so I'm at the point in my life where the only thing I can really control is me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's my own, my own reaction, my own perspective, my own behavior, just, just me. How am I going to respond to that? It's, it's a reminder of personal responsibility and accountability. And that's a big thing for me how this is, it's like there here's the situation i'm in it what am i going to do about it how am i going to respond so this this the wheel always just reminds me of that and that's why i like it it's difficult at times but we need difficult it's how we grow so um the wheel is my favorite my next favorite is probably death. Just because it's death and rebirth. It's metamorphosis. It's trans it's transforming from one form to another. And I feel that I have done this so many times in my life. And it's a never ending process. It's just it's you know it's very, you know, birth, death, and taxes. You can count on those. <laughs> you know, it's um, it's a thing. It's a process, and it happens to everyone. It affects everyone and everything. And it's also the card of Scorpio, and I'm a Scorpio son, so I do feel, I do feel a really strong connection to death. So I would say death is probably my second favorite major. If I had to pick a third. Probably go with the moon because I feel like this is where I live <laughs> a lot of the time um, I'm very connected to lunar energy I kind of always have been and 
And I don't know, it's, it's just one of those cards that seems like it might be a bit scary just because things are hidden and unseen, but that's kind of where I'm comfy. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's the, if it's the Scorpio in me or, or what, but, um, I don't have a problem navigating in here. Sometimes I would rather be here <laughs> than out here, so to speak. But, um, if I had to pick the three, it would be the wheel death and the moon. Yeah. Empress is a close because of the Venus association. I, I tend to prefer the majors that are more process oriented than people oriented. Like the first, like the magician through, or even the fool for me, it's the magician through the hermit are kind of the people archetypes of the majors and cards like these are the process archetypes. So archetypes can be more than just people. They can be objects or processes. And I tend to gravitate and resonate with the process archetypes a little bit more. So yeah, that's, that's that. <laughs> Got a very long answer. Question number six, favorite suit of the miners and why? Mm. If you would have asked me this question even like a month ago, I probably would have said coins. I always tend to gravitate toward coins, which I, I don't entirely know why. Here's the three of pentacles. But lately, I've really been feeling kind of the pull to connect with fire energy. Fire is the element of which I have the least of in my chart. I do have my Venus and Neptune in Sagittarius and Lilith um, in Sagittarius in my eighth house. So that's it for fire for me. So I'm really kind of gravitating toward wands and fire as a whole right now. And that could change tomorrow, but yeah, right now, kind of feeling the wands. It's usually coins, but wands is making its presence known. So that's the answer to that question. Right now, wands. Question number seven, which of the courts would you consider as your significator? This is harder for me just because, as I've mentioned in my court card series, I look at courts as behavior. And any one of us can behave in any one of those ways at any given time. Um, so I don't, I don't think I can pick one. If, if, if as far as a significator goes, if anything, I resonate more with death as a significator versus a court card. Um, if a court card comes up and I'm really feeling connected to that energy at the moment, I can kind of count that as a significator. Is If we're talking about like relating the courts to the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs, we'll, we'll, we'll do that one. My significator in that context would be the Queen of Cups because I am an INFJ and INFJs, uh, that type is associated with um, Queen of Cups. And I am a water sun. The water, the, the court for Scorpio is the King of Cups though, which sometimes I feel I'm in, but usually not. It makes sense though, just because the King for me, the Kings for me are air. King of Cups actually goes with my Enneagram quite well because I am a four wing five. And the four is very heart centered. Um, it's it's one of it's in the heart triad of the the enneagram symbol, and so the four is the last type of the heart of the heart center, and five is the first type of the thinking center. And so it's very it's analytical, and so it is kind of King of Cups, air of water. Interesting. Never thought about it that way <laughs> until now. In my night's video, I mentioned how in, I feel for so much of my life I have been in Knight of Pentacles energy, just kind of that slow burner, you know, creativity. 
that fire energy is there, but it's pentacles, it's earth, so it's slow. <laughs> I feel like I've spent a lot of time here. Um, but now, uh, Knight of Cups is making its presence known for me a little bit. I can't remember if that's the one I showed earlier. It might have been. I think so. Find it again. The knights are on horses in this deck, which is interesting, but they're very close up, which for me, that's the fire presence. It's that intensity. Knight of Cups is kind of making its presence known. So I don't, I don't really think I can say I have one significator court that applies to me all the time. If I were doing a reading where I would select a significator from the courts, I would choose the one that I feel is the most relevant for me at that time, um, the behavior which I feel I'm embodying or maybe would like to embody at that time. I would, I would probably navigate toward that particular court at that time. Question number eight, is cardstock a big deal for you? No, no it isn't. Um, I can make anything work. That being said, there are certain styles that I feel are overall slightly more pleasant to use. Um, the Mara Loon is a perfect example because it is not oversized and it's linen. This is the Game Crafter version. The MPC version I think is the standard smooth, but this is linen-y. I do like linen, I, I have to say. It's like this um, and like Darkness of Light. I do find that cardstock experience fairly pleasant and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it I'm gonna say it I like Los Scarabeo cardstock yes I do I like it not the glossy one that like what was that deck healing light tarot that was a Los Scarabeo deck and they put it on this really chippy glossy cardstock and had I actually liked that deck more than I did I would have made it work but I didn't care for the deck so it's in my pass box but this just standard kind of satiny, smooth, low scarabeo cardstock. I like it. I just do. It's easy to handle and I like the size. They're like taller and skinnier than US Games decks. And I like, I like this. But as far as like glossy, yeah, it's like meh, you know, but um, I, I won't, that won't deter me from getting a deck if I like it well enough. Like the Encore Tarot by Chiro Marchetti. It's a perfect example. I think it's glossy, shiny, and it's got blingy red edging. I have, I, I think I would have a bigger thing about, about gilding than I do about cardstock, if I'm honest, but I can make gilding work too. But, um, but as a whole, Cardstock's not a big deal for me, um, but if I if I could pick, like if I <laughs> if a deck was offered in, you know, an extremely gloss in an extreme gloss or a linen, um, yeah, I'm picking the linen. <laughs> I, I I just am. Um, a lot of some of that is practical too, just because glossy cardstock is sometimes difficult to film or photograph, and um, satiny and matte and linen is much easier to to do that with. So that's just a purely practical standpoint, but. But yeah, if I could pick linen for all my decks, I'd pick linen. But as a whole, um, cardstock's not going to deter me from getting a deck. Question number nine, do you read for others? At this time, no. Um, I only read for myself. I have done like a couple collective readings for um, our Oracle Obsessed group, uh, Rhiannon's group on Facebook. I've done some of the readings I've done for myself on this channel. I did with the intention that if my viewer got something from it they could take that for them but as far as doing readings like on a one-on-one -on -one basis or for money no not at this time that being said that is an avenue for me that i really feel could eventually come um i'm not feeling the pull too terribly right now but i think it will i think that will manifest <laughs> probably within the next year or two but at this point in time I'm really content with just uh, reading for me. So at this time, I do not read for others, but I am absolutely open to that possibility in the future. Question number 10, the deck release I'm uh, most excited about this year. That would be Claire Max Tarot, the Rain Shadow Tarot. There is a, it's coming to Kickstarter. I don't, I haven't gotten an email that it's been launched. I have it as a saved um, to be notified for when that 
um, project launches. I have a feeling I will back it. I'm not 100% sure because I haven't seen enough of the cards. I want to see a little bit more. Um, her, I do have her Illuminated Earth and her Faceted Garden and Oracles, and I love her work. And this tarot, I have high hopes for it, and I'm pretty confident that I will back it, but I do want to see a little bit more first. I'm really, really hoping that I'm not hyping this deck up too much for myself because um, I don't want to be you know, too terribly disappointed if it isn't what I think it could be. But um, Claire Mack is a uh, Washington State-based creator. In fact, she lives relatively close to where I live. I would say we are within the same region. And the, the Rain Shadow Tarot, that name, is um, very much related to the region in which we live. So I don't know if that aspect is going to be brought into the deck. I really, really hope that maybe it is, but um, I'm very excited to see what the rest of that deck looks like. And so I will be checking it out as soon as it's, um, as soon as that campaign goes live, I will be taking a look. Other than that, I really haven't, I've seen a lot of pre-orders and things that are coming out and there isn't a whole lot actually that's new that is catching my eye. If anything, my attention is going to older stuff. Um, not necessarily like vintage, but older stuff like, like this. Like these decks that are still in print but have been around for a while. Like the original printing, this printing of The Secret Terror I believe was in the 90s early mid 90s something like that I don't know this is just kind of where this is kind of where my attention is at right now there are a couple of vintage decks that I wouldn't mind getting my hands on this year I'm in really no rush to get either the either one of the ones that I'm thinking of but yeah I'm just there isn't a whole lot I'm excited about with the exception of that Claire Mac Tarot I'm really excited for that so that answers question number 10 next Livy has some lightning round questions so see if we can make this quick. Coffee or tea? I absolutely cannot choose. That's like choosing children. Sorry, Livy, can't pick. Love them both. Need them both. Must have both. Colors or monochrome? Yeah, this one's hard too. Can I have some middle ground and say that I like a limited color palette or I like um, a black and white or a sepia toned deck with maybe some splotches of color. I really like that. That's an aesthetic, a visual aesthetic that kind of appeals to me, I suppose. Um, if I had to choose, I suppose I would choose color just because there's such a wide range of possibility there. Not so much with monochrome, <laughs> but um, I suppose if I had to pick one, I'd pick color. Cats or dogs? I will admit I am more of a cat person. I have a cat. I love my cat. I've had cats ever since I can remember. I have never been without a cat. Um, no, I had three years where I was not with a cat and it was a very sad three years, <laughs> but um, I love dogs. I love dogs. I would love to have a dog right now, but I don't have the space or the time for one and we're just not home enough and that absolutely would not be fair to the dog. So at this time, I would love to have a dog, but don't just because of those reasons. So if I, if I have to say I lean one way, I lean more toward cats than dogs, but I do love both. Flora or fauna? Oof. Flora is important to me just because of the herbs and spices and things that I, I use with plants, but, but I guess I'll pick fauna just because I do love animals and my cat's name happens to be Flora, so I kind of get I kind of get that best of both worlds there. <laughs> so that's kind of cheating in a way. <laughs> but so I suppose if I had to pick, I would choose Fauna for that one. Favorite time of day. I'm going to borrow a photography term for this one and say golden hour. It's that 30 to 60 minute time frame before sunset. I love that time of day. I love when the sun begins to get low and there is a warm hue. Even when it's cloudy, you can still kind of tell, <laughs> you know, it's that time of day. And I didn't make this connection for years, but it just so happens that that is the time of day I was born. I was born in the autumn about five minutes before sunset. And I don't know if there's a connection there, but that has always been my favorite time of day. I love that time of day. I feel very much settled in my body 
when I know the day is getting to that point where the sun's about to go down, but there's still, you know, some light and, and a bit of a glow. So golden hour is my favorite time of day. Favorite things besides tarot. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, divination as a whole, um, besides tarot, I guess just all encompassing is a thing. Um, the occult in general is, is a thing for me. It always has been ever since I was a child. I, I remember being interested in things that I didn't know or couldn't see or things that couldn't be proved but there were experiences of them anyway, you know, whether it was my own or accounts I would read from others. So uh, the occult, the unknown, the mystery has always fascinated me. Um, in a more pragmatic sense, I love food. I like cooking. I like to cook at home. I do like going out to eat and having, trying new places, but I like cooking at home. Um, coffee and tea are big things for me. I like reading and writing. Um, anything psychology, anything to do with behavior um, is, is right up my alley. Um, I like photography and I'm very much getting into video creation now, now that I have a channel. Um, video making and has become a bit of a thing for me. Um, I do love plants and I try really hard to keep the ones I have alive. I don't always succeed. That's why I consult that master list of plants that even you, even, you know, someone like me can't kill like my spider plant behind me. That thing is, I've neglected that thing for weeks at a time and it's still just prolific. So I do, I do like plants. Hiking and trail running. I haven't been on a trail in months. Part of it has been the weather. Part of it has been me not having any motivation <laughs> to go out on a trail, but um, I love being outside. I like being on the trails. Um, trail running was an activity that essentially kept me sane during the pandemic. Um, that's when I, I started it. it I, I was walking on a trail that I had walked countless times. It's, it's, in, it's in the town where I live. And all of a sudden, I was just like, I wonder what would happen if I ran. And I just started running on the trail. And it's a, it's a trail with a lot of uh, switchbacks and angles. And so it wasn't like just straight ahead. So I had to be careful, but um, I did a little running. I didn't run the whole thing, but I ran a bit of it and got kind of hooked on, on running on trail. I never considered myself a runner. I hate running on the road. I tire when I run on the road and I get bored when I run on the road. And I just don't like running on the road. Running on trails on the other hand is a whole different ball game. And I really, I really enjoy it. I think that's it. <laughs> I feel like I've been talking for a very, very long time. Hopefully in editing, it will not reflect that as much as I feel it does. But um, this was super fun and I'm just so excited that I was able to work that Tarot Origin Story VR as chaotic as it was <laughs> into, into this one just because it fit that second question so perfectly and nothing else felt right for that one but 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 this was this was perfect so um thank you Livy for creating this tag I hope you get a lot of participation um, because it's a great tag and the questions are really really good so I hope that there are more responses to this and I can't wait to watch the ones that pop up and thank you Jonaki for your tag that came out it's been a while <laughs> it's 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 been a while and um and I'm glad I finally uh, got to got to do that one. So yeah, I filmed another video this morning and I'm in the process of editing that one. And I might film one more actually after this one. I'm kind of on a filming roll and I think I'm just going to do the thing and they're, they're just going to be one upload for me after another, <laughs> but that's just kind of the energy I'm in right now. So I think I'm going to finish my frosted mint cocoa and, and make another video. So yeah. That's all I have for this one, <laughs> a lot. Um, so until my next one, take care and be well.